What's going on, everybody? Hope all of you are having a great day so far. Welcome to the latest edition of the Hub of Champions with your host, Shukri Rice, the guest does not have a name, unfortunately, which, he, which is why he does not have a name tag. Or do you have a name tag? We do have a name tag. We're going to take out the old school name <laughs> tag from the Tennessee locker room. I was so fortunate that I oh had my, it here. That's amazing. There it is. Number 12, <laughs> Matt Sims. I can't hold it here the whole damn show, but at least, you know, now, like, all right, you know, this is who I am. This is my identification card for the show. Uh, but yeah, man, I, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much for having me on the Hub of Champions. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we were teasing, right? You know, behind the scenes here at Believe, you know, Lindsay, who does great work for us and helps us yeah. out, right, in our own particular shows. Uh, she didn't hook you up with the name tag. So I just, I brought my own for me just in case. You know, I'm like that guy sitting out at the airport, you know, like, all right, here, here's here's what I got to pick up, you know, but uh, it's all good, man. I appreciate yeah, having me. I've seen that before. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, for those of you that don't know, the man who I have on the pod uh, for this episode is a former NFL quarterback himself. He played two seasons with, with the New York Jets He was, um, and, and whatnot, and... Also, as you as you may have saw, if, for those who are watching on YouTube, a Tennessee Volunteer alum. He's also the son of of, of Phyllis Sims, as you've seen on NFL on NFL Today on CBS. Also, a Giants legend in his own right. The gentleman himself, Matt Sims, joins the pod. He's also the co-host of Sims Complete, a Believe Network show that he does with his dad, talking all things NFL football. Um, so, Matt. Yes, sir. Super Bowl 58 just concluded. The confetti yeah. has fallen. The Chiefs are officially a dynasty. What are your early thoughts on, on, on this now new dynasty that is in the NFL? And just what makes this particular dynasty unique? Because it is unique in its own way uh, in comparison to what we just saw for 20 years with the New England Patriots. But what makes the Chiefs dynasty unique um, in, in this particular time? I think what we've seen here recently with these modern day dynasties, when we talk about the two dynasties that took place with the New England Patriots, now this new one taking place with the Kansas City Chiefs, you know, the one commonality between those three or the the two, uh, depending on how you look at it, is the fact that these teams found multiple ways to win these big games and their matchups. And, you know, I think it's a it's a great just it just shows you the great coaching staff, the great players, everything, all that kind of stuff. The ability to obviously motivate, you know, grown men into understanding the bigger picture, right? The spoils of war, playing together for each other that way. Uh, how to how to uh, manage the cap, the modern day cap, free agency, all those things. I think are just so unbelievable that the Kansas City Chiefs were able to obviously manage this through this when when Tyree Kill left. Everyone thought that the Chiefs would be done forever. You know, Patrick Mahomes has gotten better and better each and every year. Andy Reid is establishing himself as one of the greatest NFL coaches of all time now. And uh, it really does just – it's hard to really put into words. But, you know, we just have to understand that we are witnessing greatness. We are part of a great history time period in the NFL. And we really should enjoy it as much as possible because I would believe that the Chiefs in every Super Bowl that they played in we're actually not the better overall team potentially, but they still found ways to win Correct. three out of those four Super Bowls. You know what's amazing? As you said that, in each of the three Super Bowls that they've won now, they were down by at least 10 points going on going into the half. And what I also find amazing about this is that you mentioned about the departure of Tyree Kill. And I mentioned this in Boston on Friday about, about the challenges that this team has had to overcome this season. Most chiefly, they had to win the division, the division round and the AFC title games on the road. Right. The only home playoff game they had was the, was the, uh, the wild card game against Miami. But I think the bigger challenge for me with this Chiefs team this past season was they led the NFL in drop passes. And I was one of the critics this entire regular season, which 
The Kansas City Chiefs, I don't think this is their year to win, to win the Super Bowl. There are Achilles heel, the receivers. Mm-hmm. I was critical of Kadarius Tony, literally from Jump Street, from opening night against the Detroit Lions. <laughs> I was critical of, of, of just the, the, the weapons that they had. And I wasn't concerned about Isaiah Pacheco, but I was concerned about outside of Kelsey, who was going to be that guy that Patrick Mahomes goes to in passing situations. Matt, when you look at what Patrick Mahomes just accomplished, would you agree that this season was arguably the most difficult in terms of the challenges that he's had to overcome? And also, does this also now shed Mahomes in a new light that he can win the big one without a number one receiver, something that Tom Brady was able to do for so many years? Yeah, I mean, all, all the great quarterbacks that we talk about, they're, they're obviously just like savants in their own field, the offense that they run, right? And and through experience, through success with that early team, right, with great players surrounding them, they learn how to improve everyone else around them eventually too. And I think that's what we're seeing here too. Early on, Mahomes was in that tandem with Tyreek Hill, with really a young Travis Kelsey in his prime, all that kind of stuff. Now... Patrick Mahomes is the one that is in his quote-unquote prime. Now, I know he won Super Bowls before that, but now he's in his prime more so as as a leader, as a cerebral quarterback, as a quarterback that knows when to take chances, when to protect the football, when to to go and scramble and run and make plays with his legs. And, And that's something, too, that just, you know, is a credit to him, I think, the loss earlier in this year. There's two, there's three games that I really look at, right? I look at the Eagles game. I look at the Bills mm-hmm. game with the Travis Kelsey lateral, oh, yeah. and then I look at the the Las Vegas Raiders game. I, I said on my podcast with my father that those three losses are losses that help you really understand as a team what exactly it is you are, what exactly your weaknesses are. And to me, when you have those type of moments, you know, like let's go to that, that Chiefs uh, Bills game or that Chiefs Eagles game for an example the the Chiefs came out of those losses learning more about themselves than the victor in that game you know the Bills came out and said hey we just beat a really good team you know mm-hmm. we just got to keep doing what we're doing you know the Eagles came out of that game and they were 10 and 1 and they're like we just got to keep doing what we're doing we're winning ugly that's all that matters but the Chiefs really had to have those like hey man you know we need to really start to establish, like, we got to get Travis the ball more. We got to get Isaiah Pacheco involved more. We got to get guys like Rasheed Rice going and active in the game plan more often. We got to lean on our defense more aggressively. And that's the thing yeah. that I think people really need to understand is that this defense was probably the second or third best defense of the league right behind the Baltimore Ravens. Didn't give up. Uh, I think they gave up 26 points in one game this year. Other than that, I don't think they gave up more than 20 the rest of the season. And that just kind of just shows you that the strength of their team was defense. Mahomes and Andy had to adjust Mm -hmm. to that as the year went on. They understood kind of what it took for their team to win. And they knew that, shit, if we score more than 21, we're probably going to win the game because our (laughs) defense is holding down the four for us. And that was something that I thought that was really impressive, Um, like like especially in in a lot of stages of – the regular season in which that I looked at this Kansas city defense and it was in the defensive coordinator, Steve Spagnuolo, who I was extremely um, aware of going back to his days with the New York giants. And I think that people need this, I need this reminder and I may have forgotten the 07 giants that won the Super Bowl that beat the, that beat Tom Brady with Eli Manning, a future hall of famer himself. The first time, they had the best pass rush of, of, of any defense that I've seen probably in the last in the last 20 years. And that's not hyperbole. Because if you go back and you look at what the Giants had, and that was with Steve Spagnola as defensive coordinator, right? They had a, a, Mac, a Michael Strahan, who was in the final year of his Hall of Fame career, an OCU Manura, a Justin Tuck, um, a, a Jay Alford, and and not and not to be forgotten, um, Antonio Pierce as well. Who, who, who was part of that linebacking core, who's also the head coach of the Las Vegas um, Raiders now. Fast forward a number of years later to, to 2023, here, here you go again. You have Chris Jones. You have other moving pieces in that defense, as well as Chris Sneed in the secondary. 
I think, and you mentioned how this year the pick on the, the Chiefs have had to to lean on the defense a lot more than they have have had in, in years past. But what I, but what I realize is that if you are going to win the Super Bowl, you have to have an elite pass rush. I think it's so important, it's critical, especially when you get into those third down situations where where you're where more times than not you you're, you tend to, you tend to blitz, and that's what. I, I saw on Sunday um, between the Chiefs and as well as the Niners. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that that what Spags has done as a defensive coordinator. I mean, if there's a Hall of Fame for assistant coaches in the NFL, like he is a first ballot Hall of Famer. And what mm-hmm. he did now to stop one of the best offenses that we had ever seen in the history of the NFL and the New England Patriots in 07 was absolutely phenomenal. How he was able to obviously yep. make adjustments for the first time that they played to the Super Bowl. You know, the 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 hall the MVP of that game really was Spagnola and that defense, you know, and just the way that they kicked the crap out of Tom Brady. In this yep. case, you know, he did a great job again of maximizing talent and ability and also minimizing the strength of the San Francisco 49ers offense and Kyle Shannon, what he does, the 49ers move the ball effectively, but in key situations and downs, Spagnola seemed to have just the exact right call and right answer. And not only that, their players executed it phenomenally well. So all the shifts, all the motions, the players were all over it. Trent McDuffie is one of the best corners in the league. Legereus Sneed is one of the best corners in the league too. The fact that you got both of those dudes on either side of the, the line of scrimmage is absolutely phenomenal. To go to their defensive line, Pinnell played absolutely phenomenal in this game. Chris Jones, a disruptor mm-hmm. again. He disrupted maybe three or four plays that were probably walk-in touchdowns, and he literally changes the outcome of the game just by being in Brock Purdy's area and affecting his throw and his accuracy. You know, guys like Carl Loftus played absolutely phenomenal in this game too as well. Guys like Chanel. Uh, another impact football yeah. player along with Nick Bolton at the linebacker position. So it just it just shows you that this team, and, and also too, remember, like this is the youngest defense in the league. So this team really rebuilt their football team. They got a lot of young talent on the mm. defensive side of the football. They made a fantastic schematical decisions, but also in the prime heat of the moment, they executed them flawlessly. And that just speaks to the leadership and the execution of the players on that side of the football. Because in the beginning, there's no doubt they were getting pushed around. At the end of the game, there was no doubt that they were winning a lot of those football battles. And I said it earlier in the week, you know, I kind of made a checklist. And I said that the Chiefs O-line and D-line were better than the Niners. Everyone went crazy on me and said I was nuts. And, you know, I understand that the Niners have the better superstars with Trent (laughs) Williams and Nick Bosa. But the truth is, as a whole collective unit, the Chiefs offensive and defensive lines played better, more consistently, especially in the big moments of the game, too. And that's a credit to some of those other guys outside of Chris Jones that are unsung heroes. And it's funny you mentioned about Trent Williams because th- he had a couple of really huge penalties in that first half that 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 were that, that were like legitimate drive killers. And I and I thought the undisciplined play of the Niners was going to come back and haunt them at some point, and it did ultimately because every play and every drive in the Super Bowl is so important. You can go back and pinpoint certain moments in games, and 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 like and, and I think we all can agree to. When you're playing Patrick Mahomes, you have to play perfect football. Mm-hmm. You can't play imperfect football and win against Mahomes. Maybe against a lesser quarterback, and that's no disrespect to any other quarterback in the league, but Mahomes is a different level where you, ha- you have to truly be at your best. You saw that in 2020 with uh, with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. The year they, they beat the Kansas City Chiefs, and that was Mahomes' only Super Bowl loss up until this point right, right now. Now, Looking at the Niners, I am frustrated because this is now twice that I looked at the Niners going into the second half of a and I've said you should you should in fact have learned from Super Bowl 54 the mistakes that were made and don't repeat those mistakes again. Somehow the Niners actually repeated those some of some of those same mistakes. And it cost him dearly, including not knowing the overtime rules in the Super Bowl. 
So, Matt, I'll, I'll ask you this. Like, what are two, th- two or three things in your vision that the Niners did wrong that ultimately cost them Super Bowl 58? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, like my my opinion of this is a little different than I think most people. I think Kyle Shanahan takes way too much of just the the blame in these situations. And this even goes back to when I was on the Falcons with him and we lost the Super Bowl when we were up 28 to three against the Patriots. You know, for whatever reason, he mm. gets blamed for that situation. But nobody talks about Dan Quinn giving up, you know, 30 points to lose the game, too. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things where just like, yeah. Super Bowls are crazy one-off games. A lot of crazy things can happen. He's a phenomenal coach. The fact that he has coached in three Super Bowls just kind of tells you that this dude knows what the hell he's doing. And I think that, you know, you don't, of course, we don't want to say eventually he'll figure it out, but just like my money's betting on that Kyle Shanahan is going to win Super Bowl by, by the time his career is over. You know, now, unfortunately for Kyle and everyone else in the league, too, you are competing against Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes. And this is kind of like a Montana Walsh era like it's a Tom Brady Belichick uh, era type of moment. It's a Phil Jackson, Michael Jordan like Mm. era right now in sports. Uh, So the muff punt was huge. That absolutely changed the whole flexion of the game. If Christian McCaffrey doesn't fumble the football on the opening drive of the game, I think that totally changes it. Uh, and then the one that I really kind of look back to mm-hmm. that I think really was the biggest play of the game is really the third and uh, the third down in two situations, the third and fourth, uh, the third and four to go uh, at the end of the game in the fourth quarter where if Brock Purdy, the ball's tipped at the line streams by Trent McDuffie Spags calls a great defensive call, right? And he gets a free runner at uh, Brock Purdy in a quick game situation. If Brock Purdy looks to the inside at Brandon Ayuk on the inside slant, he's going to complete that for potentially a 15 or maybe a touchdown type of play. But he looked outside to Juwan Jennings. LeJarrius Steed was draped all over him. So even if McDuffie doesn't tip the football at the line of scrimmage, LeJarrius Steed probably makes that tackle, right? So that's one. That was a huge play Mm. in the game. Lack of execution and just getting it done on that play. The second one, obviously, is an overtime third and four situation. Again, they're in the low red zone, and somehow your center, right guard, and tackle don't block the best defense alignment for the Kansas City Chiefs when you had not one, but two players wide open in the end zone for a touchdown. And that's where I think, Mm -hmm. you know, again, it's the X's and O's, it's the Johnny's and Joe's, and things like that are the reason why I had more faith in the Kansas City Chiefs offense and defensive line because they kind of showed to me as the year went on, early on in the year, offensive line struggled, no doubt. As the year went on and what they did against McDonald's defense and the Baltimore Ravens, I thought that, man, this is one of the most improved offensive lines that we had seen all year. And I thought when I saw Mm -hmm. the San Francisco 49ers play the Detroit Lions, I thought, wow, like the Detroit Lions are not a good defensive line and yet they're pushing around the 49ers in obvious passing situations. So that's why I doubled down with the Chiefs in both of those line of scrimmages. And I feel like those are the two spots that late in the game, because, hey, the Niners dominated the trenches in the first half. But that doesn't mean anything, right? The game's won in the fourth quarter, and that's yeah. where the Chiefs won it too. The battle of the trenches is often often either wins or loses games in the NFL. And, and as you know um, very well, uh, Matt Sims, who, by the way, you can catch on Sims Complete, also on Believe Network, with his dad, New York Giants legend Phil Sims. Go check it out as well. Now that the NFL season is officially over, which kills me, and that name tag – I'm asking you to please hold it up for 60 seconds because that is this is like a like a like a Polaroid moment here. <laughs> like you holding up your 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 your, your, your Tennessee Volunteers name tag. <laughs> that that is such that's a, that is such a great a, a great thing that that not only that you that you have it in this moment, but <laughs> that you're holding it up as well as we're talking about football and the end of the NFL season. And we all know the NFL is 24. 24- Seven three sixty five. We all know that, and I can't stop laughing. I can't stop smiling because I'm just like, man, this is this is such a great screenshot moment. Like, oh my goodness! But <laughs> now that the off season is here, 
we have we have we have, tra- we have um the, the combine coming up we have free agency coming up we have the draft coming up in april the next question i'm asking you is is patriots specific because the patriots have the third overall pick in this upcoming april's nfl draft it's no secret the world knows even infants know the patriots need a quarterback that that <laughs> that's the that's the obvious part what's not obvious is who do they select at number three in terms of a quarterback? And there are a lot of people that are saying you should go get Marvin Harrison Jr. I don't question the, the talent that this man has, but if you're going to ask me, what's the greater need here, receiver or, or quarterback? I, ha- I had former Patriots linebacker Matt Chatham on this podcast ab- about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And he said emphatically, the Patriots need to go get a quarterback. So I'll ask you, the former NFL quarterback here on the pod, what's the greater need for the Patriots at pick number three? Uh, Of course, having a franchise quarterback and a franchise talent is absolutely got to be at the top of your list because we've all seen now recently just how much that can change you know, the fate of your program and organization. I mean, look at the Cincinnati Bengals. You know, we've never been as interested in the Bengals ever until Joe Burrow was there, you know. Um, You know, maybe since Boomer Esiason, Mm -hmm. you know, and the same thing with the Patriots and Tom Brady, of course, the same thing with the Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes. So we all know the importance of that position and how it is the driving force of just how you perceive yourself as an organization for future years to come. And, uh, and and we'll see with Coach Mayo now as the, as the new head coach, we'll see kind of what he values. Does he go and does he get somebody in free agency and kind of get someone as a stopgap type of quarterback and kind of help build a, you know, a, a team that's a little bit more athletic and faster on the outside with this draft? Or does he go right now for the quarterback and try to be super aggressive as soon as he gets that done, getting the athleticism to add to it like a Houston Texans did in the draft previous, right? A Houston Texans, they got C.J. Stroud. That was awesome. He changed, yeah. obviously, the fate of their program. But then they go and got a Tank Dell later in their draft. He becomes a day one starter for them and an impact player right away. So if the Patriots go the quarterback route, can you immediately go into the draft and find a player like the Texans did and get someone that is going to be impact day one starter for you at the receiver position or some sort of skill position offensively, whether it's running back, receiver, or tight end, or maybe damn near all three of them if you can, because that really is, I think, the most glaring weakness to this football team is they just lack overall athleticism and speed on the outside and the offensive side of the football. And, you know, I don't care who the hell your quarterback is. If you're slow, if you're getting covered up, and if your scheme stinks, you're not going to do very well. So they got to do a a really uh, Mm -hmm. uh, just go over the top with making sure that they help whatever young quarterback that they draft or if they go with the veteran out and getting somebody older and, and waiting for the guy that they really know is their guy. And you look at the skill position players that are that are going to be uh, coming into the NFL this upcoming draft in, in two months. I can't help but to think that with the Patriots, they have so many needs that, and, and you alluded to it you know, a little bit in your response that they need help in terms of the skill. They need they, the skill set. They need help in terms of having speed. They right. also need help. Um, especially along the offensive line you know, and, and the running back and, and so forth. After the third overall pick, if you're the Patriots, like, is there a, is there a player for you in your mind that stands out in terms of a, maybe a day two um, NFL prospect that the Patriots could utilize, whether it be on offense or defense? Like, who is that guy for you? Yeah, I mean, to me, you know, if I was trying to be real strategic as far as who I was valuing and kind of building my program, if I didn't like, let's say if Caleb Williams, Drake May, right, um, if they were gone, of course, and then you're kind of left with the rest of the field, if you weren't super confident in whoever you had at that three position at the quarterback position, 
I would say go ahead and take an offensive lineman or a skilled player that you know will be a day one starter. And then, you know, maybe a Michael Penix falls to you later on in the draft, right? Because of his injury history and all that kind of stuff too. So mm-hmm. it, it's going to be interesting, but you know, it, it depends on kind of how obviously all these things happen behind the scenes. You know, of course, everyone in the mock drafts has like seven quarterbacks going in the first round. We even got JJ McCarthy going in the first round in some mock drafts right now. Now, you know, so we don't really know what exactly wow. or how it's going to take place. But, you know, just with this mock stuff, of course, more QBs are going to go because uh, that's the only position we could damn near talk about for that long. So uh, we'll see how how it plays out. But I think the Patriots <laughs> really do have to be super aggressive with just getting skill players and talent back on their football field. I think they're pretty good on the defense and offensive lines. I know that they're not like the top of the league, you know, 1A on the offensive defensive line, but the 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 need is absolutely on the outside and just getting more athletic. When you look at today's NFL, because I want to talk, I want to touch on this particular topic. Like the, this league has become so athletic at every position that when you go into the draft, you are you you're, you're, you talked about it. You you're looking to get that athletic guy that can be a potential game changer, whether it be on offense or defense at the skill skill um, position and so forth. And when you when you look at Kansas City, and I'm going to use Kansas City for it as an example, I look at their running back Isaiah Pacheco, someone who's athletic, but he runs angry, and I'm fascinated because Pacheco we have seen in what two years in, in the league, obviously winning back to back Super Bowls, but the kind of impact that he's had on on on, on the running game for Kansas City. Mm-hmm. So the question I'll ask you is when you when, when you are looking at running backs in particular, because we all know running backs have a shelf life in the NFL. Like, what is something that you're looking for? Is it is it a quality? Is it an intangible that you're looking for that's that that helps you say, hey, you know what? I think this, this guy could really be a difference maker for our offense who doesn't necessarily have to be our first round pick but someone who can be a potential difference maker for you. Yeah, and let's remember too, Isaiah Pacheco is a guy that was drafted, I mean, you know, late in the NFL draft. I want to say that Isaiah Pacheco was drafted maybe 10 or 11 picks in front of Brock Purdy, funny enough, and then there they are two years later playing in the Super Bowl against each other. But, you know, it really kind of just depends on Mm -hmm. like, what aspect of uh, of the running back are you are you trying to get for a particular piece of your offense? You know, because like if you look at a guy like Blake Corum or uh, you know even another guy like a Dylan Johnson for another example or an Audric Estime, right? They're a little bit more to me of like the old school you know downhill running back. Now with Blake, I think that he can apply and do more in the passing game. We just didn't see a ton of it in Michigan, but. You know, with the other two, they seem to be a little bit more of an old school bruiser type that has the speed to go to the house, but really is a more quote unquote every down type of back player. Right. And then you got guys like the Bucky Irvings of the world who seem to be a little bit of a Swiss Army knife. They could play receiver. They could be running back. They could do all the gadget plays. You could put them in motion, get them in space. So it really kind of depends on just what you are attracted to and what you're really trying to utilize that position for in the future. You know, if you want a heavy big back bruiser, then go get yourself a Dylan Johnson. If you want a game breaking speed type of guy, go get Dylan, uh, uh, Jonathan Brooks over there from Texas. So that really is just kind of like the discussion that we'd have to have in that management room is what's more important to us to making an impact right now for our football team and what we want to do offensively. And for me, back to the Patriots specifically, you know, I would be looking at a guy like a Jonathan Brooks, a Bucky Irving, you know, guys like that who can really do a little bit more outside of just the normal inside zone, outside zone scheme and be a little bit more uh, of an impact in the passing game, in the screen game, uh, in the backfield, out of the backfield, and being more of a, a Swiss Army knife again, where you can use them in multiple formations and functions. When you look at the Chiefs, 
and you look at the rest of the NFL, because it seems like right now, I don't think there's a team that that is good enough to challenge Kansas City because of the advantage that they have at quarterback. And we look ahead to next season, which is just seven months away, give or take. But training camp, obviously, preseason game starts in August. Training camp starts in late July, obviously. But when you look around the NFL right now, as the, this the offseason is is basically at the age of a newborn. Who do you look at and say that this team is ready to be a challenger to the Kansas City Chiefs? Because right now, even in the AFC side, I feel as if the AFC alone, there's there's question marks surrounding AFC contenders like Cincinnati, the health of of, of Joe Burrow, Buffalo. They're going to have question marks. They're going to have to address this offseason. Baltimore, where do they go from here? Having the best record. Um, in the NFL and losing any AFC title game to the eventual champion Chiefs. Like, who do you look at AFC or NFC side and say that team is ready to be a challenger to the Chiefs on any NFL right now? Yeah, I mean, this this was a really interesting year because I really do believe that, you know, of course we had the Chiefs, we had the Niners in the Super Bowl. But I mean, if we go back and we look kind of like at the playoff picture, you know, there are a lot of teams that I think really had an opportunity to win the Super Bowl mm -hmm. this year, you know, and, and that's what I think is super fascinating. The Detroit Lions, to me, were absolutely capable of winning a Super Bowl mm -hmm. this year. The Green Bay Packers, I mean, they damn near, you know, they, they were beating the 49ers. Yeah. They, they let that game slip. The 49ers got outplayed in that game. They got outplayed in the Detroit Lion game, but yet somehow won that game. So it shows you how resilient they are. Thought the Green Bay Packers were a, a Super Bowl contender type of football team, whether we really knew it or not. The, the Detroit Lions were damn near close. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers were not as far as people think. Now, would they have won the Super Bowl and played great, you know, for four weeks in a row? No, but they, they are closer mm -hmm. than I think people think. You know, the Cincinnati Bengals always have to consider them, you know, with just what they have at quarterback and just their scheme and their skill players and all that. That's always big, but it'll be a big offseason for them. Uh, especially at the receiver position. Uh, the Baltimore Ravens are absolutely going to be a number one contender in the AFC. Anytime Josh Allen is on any football team in the AFC, they're going to be a contender. Hopefully the Bills can kind of upgrade their football team to help him out a little bit so they're not so one-dimensional. Uh, but, you know, this was a year that I feel like a lot of teams could win the Super Bowl. A lot of teams were capable of winning it. And really it's all about just can you string together three or four games in a row to actually hold the Lombardi trophy. And again, the Chiefs just kind of show they have the resiliency. They they have the talent on the defensive side of the football. And of course, they have a quarterback that knows it, believes in himself, the greater good of the team, knows how to win in different ways now, and uh, is a true one-of-one -one type of football player. So we'll see next year, but like, got to consider the Lions. Got to consider the Baltimore Ravens, of course. You know, you could throw Buffalo in there again just because of Josh Allen. We'll see, though. The Green Bay Packers, to me, are absolutely a sleeper. If they can improve their young football team again this year, that's another team that I would be definitely scared of because they're figuring out who the hell they are, and they're going to be a problem. And, and, you know, of course, the Cowboys, theoretically, we want to say that they're a team that compete for it. But uh, it's been a rough offseason for them so far with losing Dan Quinn and just kind of where the direction of that defense and their team goes in the future will be, you know, really interesting considering all the, the chatter that we hear from them. So uh, we'll, we'll see how it all plays out. But there's a lot of teams that can that can make a run for it. And uh, we'll see who gets hot when it's most important late in the year next year. Absolutely. Well, last question I'll ask you before I wrap up the episode. When you when you look ahead to on to the upcoming NFL offseason and free agency officially begins in March. Can you identify two or three players who who you think will in fact be moving who could potentially um make Big impacts with, with whatever new team that they end up going going to sign with. Yeah, I mean it's uh let's see. I mean, off the top of my head, uh for next year, um, you know, I don't know if I have let me get the list of the the 2024 uh free agents here right now, just so I make sure. But 
You know, I want to say that a few of them, just like off the top of my head, like number Absolutely. one that came to my mind, especially when I, I thought of uh, for the Cincinnati Bengals was T. Higgins. You know, what where does he go? What's his landing spot? Mm -hmm. He's a player that I think everyone kind of knows is like Ooh. that fringe potential superstar. Um, so kind of where does he land going forward? Um, because I don't think the Bengals will, will be able to pay him. Um, you know, another one, too, is Saquon Barkley comes up. He was on a one-year deal, so he's back up. Yeah. Derrick Henry will be another interesting one. Uh, all right, here, let me – I, I got a list yeah. here right quick, That's too. Good one. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, another one that I find extremely interesting, Chris, too, Chris though, Jones is, of Kansas City Chiefs. He's, he's, he's yeah. probably the biggest – <laughs> if I'm if I'm Chris, I'm not going anywhere, though. You know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm running it back with this dynasty and, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and I'm just telling my my agent and, and someone who does marketing for me to, to get my get some more money out there if the Chiefs don't going to pay me enough. But, <laughs> um, you know, Baker Mayfield to me is absolutely huge. Huge because what he was able to do for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers is phenomenal. It should not be understated in the latest. Dude was absolutely a baller this year. He mm. got better as the year went on. And Baker is kind of finding that, you know, number one pick vibe again that he had carrying into the NFL. Uh, Kirk Cousins is technically a free agent, mm. but I feel like the Minnesota Vikings will figure it out. Um, let me see. I got a few others. Um yeah, there, there's a lot of really good free agents here that are that are really interesting. Um, that I, I really, you know, Tyron Smith, the the what about Antoine the Winfield Cowboys, Jr. That's huge too. He's a huge part of what they do. I'd be really curious now. You know, it will they be yeah. able to pay him and a guy like Mike Evans? I don't know. I don't know if that is possible because Mike Evans' contract is up this year too. So. Um, it's going to be a really interesting year. There's going to be a lot of moving parts this off season, and we'll see if maybe like a, a team like the Kansas city chiefs, you know, goes out there and tries to get one of these veterans and just says, Hey man, we can't pay you X, but you'll be a part of, you know, this. And, uh, that could be pretty attractive to a player that maybe wants more money, but is also looking to be a part of something, you know, uh, as far as history goes and being involved in playing with the greatest quarterback that we've seen in the history of the game. Absolutely. And with that being said, I want to say thank you, uh, Matt Sims. He is the co-host of Sims Complete with his dad, uh, former NFL quarterback and New York Giants legend Phil Sims. You can catch it also right here on Believe Network. Hold up the volunteers, sign loud and proud. And, <laughs> and, and Matt, again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Um, on this episode as as the proud volunteer and a, a proud alum of the SEC joins the pod. <laughs> Matt, thank you so much, my man. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hub of Champions. Really appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we'll see what the Patriots do and look forward to talking to some more ball in the future for sure. Absolutely. I look forward to it as well, my friend.